Thank you everyone for joining. All right, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we're gonna start off with a land acknowledgement for where UC Santa Cruz is, is located. Um, the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking UB tribe. The Amamutsin tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for today's uh, Says on Speak Up, Community Resistance Against Erasure. My name is Louise Leong. I'm the Mary Porter Sesdon Art Gallery Manager. Um, I wanna give a special welcome uh, to any folks from the Beach Flats community as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, the Sesdon Speak Up series aims to provide a safe space for students and the UC Santa Cruz community to engage with ideas generated from our programmed exhibitions. This event is scheduled in conjunction with the virtual exhibition, Eduardo Carrillo, Comunidad de Califas, where you can see um, my virtual background right now. Um, our exhibition along with this event is part of the Califas Legacy Project, a multi-venue collaboration celebrating and documenting the legacy of our region's Chicano, Chicana cultural treasures. This event will be recorded. Tonight we continue ongoing conversations along the themes of community activism and visual representation that is part of the lineage of the Chicano movement. Part of this lineage is a resistance of the literal erasure of murals that depict the untold histories and everyday culture of Latinx communities. Joining us are artists and UCSC alums, Irene Juarez O'Connell and Victor Cervantes. Irene is a community-based artist inspired by the Mexican muralist tradition and Chicano movement of the 1960s in LA. She is passionate about uplifting marginalized voices through public art, mentorship, and organizing roles. Victor is an accomplished academic whose graduate research at Columbia and Harvard University focused on promoting cultural diversity through art. He is art director of the nonprofit Quinto Sol, which works with youth to empower neighborhoods through artistic expression. Today, Irene and Victor will speak about the history of the Beach Flats Park mural, its whitewashing and the community's response to recreate, reclaim space and heal together. So first we're going to start off by sharing a short video of the celebration of the mural. Public art can celebrate and memorialize local stories, history, and culture, and can bring people together in meaningful ways, spark conversations, and provoke reflection. The community's resilience here, their creativity, their strengths and hopes are evident in the mural, and I know that this will grow stronger with every brushstroke that you take together, with every conversation you have as you're painting. You are an amazing and important part of this process of shaping your public space. I'm so excited to celebrate here today with you all. Um, this is such a great opportunity. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces here celebrating this mural. I think what I'm most excited about is the involvement of the children, the young people in this community who for the future will have their contributions represented here in this park. Um, painting with Irene, I've learned um, how to be a leader, how to paint, and how much I just appreciate my community. My name is Natalia and I'm in seven years old and I really like this mural because it gave us good honor and I really liked it. A couple of years ago when I was serving as mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, the old mural was painted over. This was a mistake 
that the city contributed to because of our poor communication with this neighborhood. We are here to celebrate our culture, our identity, and our roots. We are continuing to liberate ourselves from being, being Americanized to the extent where we forget our identity. So really, I urge you to get connected with your history. This is a country that we all build. This is a country that we all struggle still, just for our identity and our color. A lot of people came from all different areas here, and we build this community. And these people, this is America. All this that you see out here, this is what I believe is America. The images in this mural are meant to celebrate culture and identities of those who aren't often represented. I invite everyone to continue supporting on the weekends. Come help put your, put your hand in. Um, this is truly our mural, your mural, and I'm, I'm very honored to be in service this way. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to our guests for the evening, Irene and Victor, to share a slideshow and talk about the history of the mural. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll start, uh, or you want to start into uh, the other slide first. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right, can you all see that okay? Great. So this is a brief history of the Beach Flats mural. And we, we started working on it. Um, well, in the Beach Flats community, if none of you uh, have ever gone to uh, Beach Flats, uh, it can be found uh, near the board, near the beach boardwalk area. Uh, and this is a slide, a segment of the neighborhood. So it is in the um, river mouth, the San Lorenzo River. Uh, right near the beach boardwalk in what is territorially, um, originally the mm -hmm. Uyipi tribe of the Awasawa speaking Ohlone peoples. And uh, so this, everything in this black triangle is what's considered the beach flats. Mm -hmm. For those of you who have not had a chance to go visit the, the mural or the park, um, you can check it out. It's at 133 Lee Brandt Avenue. And as you can see the wall, surrounds the entirety of the park. It's about six feet high and um, length is 190 feet long. It's actually one of the longest murals in Santa Cruz. Um, so let's see. So when we did it back, this was in 93. This is actually a photo of a uh, family um, visiting the park when we were working on it. So there I am. I think I was like, yeah, after our first, second year as a sophomore at, at UCSC. And uh, I took on the commission as a summer program with uh, actually another friend here, Reina, who was actually a community member still. And I was uh, the director for the Beach Flats Bureau Park. So this is a slide of us uh, hanging out at the park uh, around that time. And uh, to the side here, you'll see the Frida Kahlo mural. If anybody's from Oaks or dropped by, uh, lived at Oaks. I was for a while, I lived at Oaks too. And um, just because I had so many friends that lived at Oaks. So I, I uh, was, uh, I lived there for a bit. And, and this was uh, a mural that uh, Ed Carrillo actually helped me uh, get it sponsored to get funding to do it at Oaks. So, this is kind of the connection between the mural, the beach flats and, and uh, my work because somebody, a couple of people who lived in the beach flats area got to visit uh, Oaks uh, at my apartment at the time. Um, and they, they liked the mural. And so they talked to me about, uh, wanted to uh, ask me to drop by the, the park to take a look at the wall and come up with a design. So 
So that's, that's how those two images link. Next. Sorry, there's just a little lag between our slides here, but it's loading. So during, uh, during that summer, um, he began to work uh, with the crew and some of the community members that lived there. And the idea came about of creating um, something that was very cultural uh, because there was nothing uh, uh, like it in the Santa Cruz area. And, uh, you know, even to this day, I think there, uh, other than in the Beach Flats community there, there isn't that representation for our Latino uh, Chicano community. So, uh, so the design concepts um, began out of that idea, starting out with the, with the maiz corn, uh, giving birth to the cultura. And then it had different sections throughout in chronological order as to like, you know, the different accomplishments or challenges of our comunidad. And so here you see a few of the panels that uh, I think these were taken years later. It has a little bit of weathering, but uh, you can see a little bit of, uh, of uh, some of the imagery there. And um, also at this time, uh, it's just, I like to bring up that there were a lot of things that maybe uh, have parallels to uh, what we've been going over uh, the last few years because in the 90s, there was this really anti-immigrant sentiment going uh, in California, particularly. Uh, in the middle, uh, in the 90s, you had Proposition 209, Proposition uh, 187, uh, uh, English only for California. Uh, so there were a lot of issues going on um, within immigrant communities and, and Beach Flats wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't spared. And so that was why it was even more important to uh, base the design uh, to be uh, something that was culturally relevant in the community. So this was the first image. When you come in, that's the image that you saw. That, that's the first wall of a family hanging out at the park. And at the time, you know, Beach Flats was a little bit different. And so here you have uh, um, a lot of the, the people that hung out there um, contributed to the, well, what do we want to have? And so it was the idea of like, well, having a family in the park. And here there was a soda machine I, uh, right next to this wall that used to sell drinks. And uh, to counter that, well, uh, I don't know if I, I brought it up or somebody brought it up, but uh, I, uh, I know I had, I had read uh, uh, well, Antonio Buriciaga's book, uh, Drink Cultura. So, so we said, well, why don't we just paint a soda machine that says Drink Cultura and then start a conversation with people asking, well, what does that mean? Right, so that's that's a little bit of the history of that image. And these are a couple of more panels. This is, uh, yeah, this is years later. I, I'm going to say like uh, in the two, uh, mid two thousands, I guess. But the beautiful thing about it is that um, the, the mural was never uh, destroyed. Um, the only thing that was uh, eating away at it was the weathering. So I think uh, it endured because people had a connection to it and it was cared for by the people who lived in the neighborhood. And so as you can see, they had the, um, the moisture in the air and, and the sun uh, was, was chipping at it, but None, nothing else other than that. So that kind of, you know, sets the stage for the city deeming that the, the wall needed to be uh, whitewashed because of the condition that it was in, but rather than call up Victor and, you know, start the process of restoration, they mm -hmm. took it upon themselves to completely whitewash the wall without any communication with, the, with, with Victor, the artist, without any communication with the city. Um, and so these are uh, photos taken in June of two, 2014 of the, the wall. And um, I'd like to invite Reina actually to speak a little bit about what that feeling was of waking up to, to seeing this in the park. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it was shocking. Um, I think I was driving home from work um, when I saw painters um, 
painting and they were getting, they had already done a lot of the, the mural like on the inside of the park and it was Latino workers too. Um, and they were hesitating at the, at the panel with the Virgen de Guadalupe um, because they were like, ah, don't, I, they didn't want to do it and they didn't understand why they needed to do it, but it was their job. And when they got to their panel, I was trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and apparently the city had gone through a process and I'm sure you'll talk about that. Um, but I live in the neighborhood, have lived in the neighborhood since forever, like it's been years. Um, and it was really quite shocking. Um, and I started making phone calls at that point. Yes, um, absolutely. I think Reina is one of the driving forces that really put help organize the community to put pressure on the city mm -hmm. to really halt the process because the city had already contracted with an artist from outside the neighborhood to replace the mural um, and not in a way that was community driven or at all informed by the residents of the community. So as you can see um, where the Virgen, you know, was left there, but what they did is put this red um, spray paint that damaged part of the mural of the Virgen and also the Drink Cultura mural. So, you know, um, just just kind of shows the lack of regard or respect for the art itself, um, you know, as it covers it up there. So that was in June of 2014. And then uh, soon after that, Victor mm -hmm. was, um, do you want to share a little bit about the litigation? Yeah, I think I got a call. So maybe it was it was Reina, somebody called me, yeah, right? And, and I was told, uh, I have another friend, I think he's here, uh, Robert from uh, the Central Valley, and I got a call, but I uh, uh, I was Oops. told like, hey, the mural's gone, that it's been it painted over, and at the time I had, you know, it's been some time, but I had worked in a community center mural, and I thought it was a mural in the valley, and I was like, whoa, well, well let's go check it out, and see what we can do, but then he said, oh no, it was the one in Santa Cruz, and so that was a, a, a bit of a shock because uh, yeah, I hadn't been informed. And so uh, I think we made a, uh, I made a, a conscious uh, decision with community input as to, you know, how to proceed next. And it was about, well, you know, I have to take it to uh, uh, litigate it because it was, uh, um, it was taking a stand um, because uh, a lot of this had been happening to a lot of the murals in, in our neighborhoods throughout the state, uh, the Southwest really, right? Where uh, all of the murals had just been covered up uh, without uh, seeking the, the communication from the artists or the community. And so if we allow these things to continue to happen, they will continue to happen. Um, and we do a disrespect to, to the people in, the in our own communities and, and future generations. So that was the step uh, I decided to take. Um, and so in the meantime, I think the city was working through a process of, uh, of I, I think they put a stop in the, the project that was had already been uh, um, commissioned to replace this piece. And then, and then community members stepped in and then you wanna... So, so yeah, it was a whole year actually from the whitewashing of the mural. And then in September, 2015, Louise, if you could go back to the um, slide with the, the utility shed uh, that we found vandalized. And that actually was done by someone, maybe, you know, just not city sanctioned, but what we think happened is that the city really set the stage and that's kind of cue uh, with the disrespect. And then, you know, someone took it upon themselves to bring paint to the rest of the mural. So they covered the Virgen mural and the Drink Cultura mural. Um, and then I included a photo of Reina here because um, at that point, Reina called up Victor. Reina, can you tell the story of, <laughs> of like what, how we kind of, you know, re responded that weekend in September? So there was a lot of community outrage and also just like, it was really sad and shocking, you know, to see what had happened. And um, I think really a lot of people were really angry too. And I think in terms of trying to 
um, figure out how to sort of, uh, you know, move, give people a, an opportunity to, to like, um, to move forward. I think it was, um, I reached out to Victor and was like, hey, this is what's going on. Um, and, and just let him know, like, this is what's going on and really um, gathered the troops, gathered, not the troops, gathered mm -hmm. the community members really have to watch our language right um and um and we were able to like get together a group of people and I think I'm really grateful to Victor because I think um he drove from Lindsay to here was able to kind of you know get together and I think I talked to Nane, OT, uh, Marciano and just other folks and just said hey can we what can we do what can be done um so and Go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So right away, you know, getting the Virgin up there was of utmost importance, and and something that I kind of um, took Reina from from the action was like this is how we show our resilience. This is how we can come back even bright with a more brighter and more beautiful um, mural to to um, basically say you know that we're not going to let this these intimidation tactics uh you know get us down so there's and, you on there look <laughs> yeah. and go this ahead. happened without this happened like without um we didn't go to the city and say hey can we do this it was like this needs to be replaced and this needs to be done there's a time and a place i think to go through community process but this one was it, it there was an urgency to it and I think this was what you'd call direct action, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so Louise, if you can go to the next slide. So within a matter of two, three days, we were able to, um, to get the mural back up. It's a little blurry, but on the left, you can see Victor guiding us in um, bringing the Drink Cultura mural back to life. Yeah. I yeah, like uh, after I get I got the call from Reina about uh, the the second the last piece being covered up, uh, I had to make it you know just an effort. Okay, drive by over there and uh, you know within that weekend we got it together and 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 painted over what we could. Mm -hmm. And next slide. So that's what it looks like today. Next slide. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of context in which the mural was erased. So in, uh, so the mural was whitewashed in 2014. Um, and then months later, we learned that the Seaside Company, which um, owns the boardwalk, uh, intended to remove the lease from the Beach Flats Garden. And there had been ongoing, I think, you know, they tried this again in 2008 and then in 2004. So this was again, a, another attempt to remove the garden. And for the garden, um, I mean, for the community, the garden is a sanctuary where a lot of uh, folks, particularly immigrant Spanish speaking folks can tend to their, their cultural um, heritage of, of growing heirloom seeds and, um, you know, just a safe space in the community. And so for the mural to be whitewashed and for the garden to once again go under threat within months of each other really felt like a full onslaught of um, attack and really a clear message from the city about their priorities. So um, next uh, slide. Oh, and just to mention that the garden also has a, a unique history that's tied in with the mural because the 1993 mural was painted around the same time that the Beach Flats Garden was established. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think at the time, uh, yeah, right around uh, the completion of the mural, then uh, other friends uh, got together with uh, Reina, I think, you know, uh, Jasmine, right? A couple of other friends. And we started doing a, a, a place with uh, our friend Marciano called La Escuelita. So some of the youth that are, you can see here in the photos actually participated in we doing us doing um, after school arts classes right there at the park at the beach and tutoring mentoring we created a, a big brothers program with oak students uh, who wanted to uh, work with the students in the in the beach flats so that was everything was going on around that same time 
And again, another form of direct action because the city, I mean, the garden uh, space was just kind of a junkyard and residents took it upon themselves to clean it up and cultivate the land. Next slide. Okay, so fast forward to um, March of 2016. I, that's, so I got involved because I was working with the garden um, to try and protect the garden. And when I had heard about, you know, what happened to the mural, I decided to apply for the, um, the city finally agreed, you know, with enough community pressure, they said, okay, we need to do a formal public arts process and uh, have an open request for proposals. So. I applied and was um, awarded the contract in spring of 2016. And immediately the, the first thing that, you know, I knew was important to do was to connect with um, the original artist, Victor, and connect really with the community that helped paint that original mural and the, and the community that lived, that was currently living there to find out you know, what is, how do we want to move forward? Because this is about healing. It's about rest, restoration. You know, there was um, felt like harm or violence enacted upon the community. So how can we come together to make um, this, this new mural uh, capture the essence of what the old mural had for the, for us and for the space while also uh, inviting, you know, fresh perspective and, and new um, energy looking forward to the future. So this is a couple of the um, the public art process uh, sessions that we had. So we had people writing down things that were really important to them. And if you can see on the table there, you know, someone wrote racism and circled it. People also wanted to see, um, you know, nature and things like that. Um, but definitely the cultural aspects of the old mural were really important to to retain. Next slide. So. Marciano, Victor, and myself were um, put the drawings together. And so these are some examples of the drawings. Um, and we included, of course, some village scenes from uh, the Uyipi, um, what Uyipi life might look like. We included uh, historical figures such as the Hawaiian princes who came to surf in Santa Cruz and really brought the culture of surfing to Santa Cruz in the 1800s. We made sure to elevate the historical contributions of the um, Chinese immigrants. Uh, so on the top panel to the left, there's uh, George Ao, who is to this day really um, prominent, you know, uh, someone who gives a lot to our community. And so part of the process was, you know, taking these designs and literally being out in the park, showing these to the community. And for the most part, they were met with a lot of enthusiasm save for a couple folks who uh, I think it, literally at one point someone told me that I didn't have enough white history in the mural. Like I wasn't highlighting enough the European contributions um, to Santa Cruz, to which I responded, you know, there's, there's so many other murals in Santa Cruz where that is uplifted um, and that, you know, of all places considering the, the demographics and the residents here in the community, I think it's, it's important that we, we highlight um, mm -hmm you know, the things that aren't being shown in other parts of the, the city. Next slide. That's, they're all a little bit blurry. Um, but anyway, so in, in June, 2016, we had a formal um, hearing up through the Santa Cruz City Arts Commission. And again, we, we heard, heard some pushback from uh, just a few folks, just, few but loud folks who said that, um, you know, we heard some pretty hurtful things actually about, about our cultura. Like someone tried to say that if we included the Aztec sunstone, the cal calendario, that it would, it would invite more gang violence into the community. Um, just, just awful things that were really not based in any kind of real research or real understanding of um, what any of these cultural icons mean. Uh, so, so hearing that, you know, really helped reinforce the importance of, you know, murals are a site of also education. You know, it's about reaffirming identity. It's about, um, you know, uh, in being a reflection of the community that lives there, but it's also about educating those who, um, yeah, had no idea. So I, I've included a photo of Ernestina Saldana because 
she really came out and said, you know, the reason that we don't know exactly what like the like a lot of, why there is ignorance around these cultural icons is because colonization wiped it, you know, wiped out a lot of this wisdom and knowledge. And we we have to like hold on to these um, wisdoms through this art practice. So I thought that was important to include. Yeah, next. So by July 2016, we are ready to um, get our hands on the wall. And of course, in the spirit of healing and um, kind of protecting the wall and the space, we, we began by blessing and washing the wall. So we invited all the children um, and their families to scrub the wall and put good intentions and kind of laying a solid foundation um, for where the paint would go. Um, so, so again, in the spirit of uh, offering blessings, we invited Indigenous elders to offer prayers and um, lay down lots of uh, medicine so that we can do this mural in a good way that was not going to be, um, you know, vandalized or that we would we would be safe while painting because that was also an issue a couple of times. Just one time, maybe there was like a resident or somebody who called mm -hmm. the cops on Marciano and, and Victor while they were painting. So, you know, um, it was really a blessing that we got Nane from Santa Cruz Barrios Unidos, Yanahe, who's part of the Ohlone Cultural Council, and um, Iskali uh, White Hawk dancers from, or not White Hawk, um, I mean, what is the, the name? Iskali from Gilroy. Um, Robert Castro, who came and brought their dance. Mm -hmm. Kali. Kali. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's a little bit from the video that you saw earlier that that event. Um, next. That's just, um, we use. Yeah, um, we can probably skip. This one is just kind of a, a in-process shot. So we use the grid method. Next. Oh, here, this, you guys could see, um, we got a couple of the aspects from the old mural. So at the top, it was uh, the original mural from the 90s. And then this is the, the one you can see on the, on the side, it, we did a, a gridding process method to enlarge the images from, uh, from I think it was just uh, one inch to a foot. And um, so I just wanted to show you guys the, the process there. And uh, it was uh, it was just thinking about like, how do we reincorporate some of the old old iconography into the present one. And, and that was one of those aspects that we left there. Mm -hmm. Next. So um, throughout the whole painting of the mural, we really emphasized uh, the importance of um, community being involved, especially the, the youth and children. Um, we invited Nicole Vasquez, who I think is on this call, to um, be a, show up as a leader. She would kind of organize all the paints each day and, and invite the younger kids to get involved. Um, so that was that was a really important aspect that that people really had their hands <laughs> in the in the painting of the, of the mural, you know, so that they can build that connection that that. Um, that physical, tangible connection to the wall and feel a sense of ownership, that sense that, you know, I put my hand, my, my work is here. Um, and especially those who, you know, don't consider themselves artists or painters or have never picked up a paintbrush in their life, for them to try something new and try and do that within community was a really potent and powerful way for, you know, connections to be built, relationships to be formed, conversations to be had. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Painting in community was, um, you know, and that's 
personally, I think our practice as muralists is it's not necessarily about the finished product, about having that beautiful wall. It really is about the process. And in that way, it's um, that's you know what makes it a community-based process for us. Next. Um, and if you want to uh, see the time lapse of the video, we do have a, a website, beachflatsmural.com, so you can check it out. Oh, it's too bad these um, photos are blurry, but there's Nicole helping uh, um, organize some of the paints. And then there's Nicole and Rina. You can go to the next one. Um, and I also wanna emphasize like how important it was for kids to be painting themselves on the left. Brianna's literally painting a, a, her face in a picture that was taken during the Posadas. And on the right, Rocket is painting himself on a scooter. Um, so that, you know, is, is really about the sense of belonging. So we know that, you know, Beach Flats has a um, historically and currently over-policed, has experienced ice raids, has constantly, you know, through uh, actions from the city been delivered the message that they don't belong, you know, that we're, you know, because they're renters there or because there's this long-term plan from you know city or seaside company that you know that their existence is temporary there so it, i felt it was really important to make sure that the youth were painting themselves on the mural so that it it really reinforces that sense of belonging and that this is their home this is their park this is where um they have the right to be next slide please Oh, yeah, here's a picture of, of Nicole and her grandfather that was painted. Um, and again, a lot of the figures, almost all of the figures that are painted in the mural are from actual photographs of, of residents and community members. Next slide. So this is uh, one of the finished panels. It's of the community during the time of Muertos. So Dia de los Muertos, um, uh, is kind of symbolized by the the Sempasochi, the Calaveras. Also, the time of the Posadas is a really um, important time. Every December, community members get together to put on the Posadas. So that's why that you know we included the Pandulce and the Vela. And then I'll just uh, mention briefly. So above the figures, there's a banner that says Dignidad para todos. Originally it said no human is illegal and the city had a little pushback on that. They, uh, I think we got a notice from the attorney, the city attorney that we probably shouldn't include that. So that was a very tense uh, moment. I think probably one of the only moments that I felt like any kind of censorship from the city, but I think we found um, a way to move forward that you know we could say essentially the same message um, that no one could negate, right? Like dignidad para todos, dignity for all is something that, you know, a value that the city couldn't, um, you know, really, really um, say anything about. <laughs> okay, we're gonna kind of move through the slides a little bit quickly uh, just for time. So we have time for questions, but again, if you have questions, please add them in the chat. So next slide is images of the garden. Um, these again, actual, gardeners, jardineras. Um, the image of white was actually uh, a historical moment. I think in the six, where, when was it? The, there was a delegation that came from um, Mexico City and did a, a cultural exchange, a seed exchange. So those are a little bit of the images. Next slide. Again, the Awasawa speaking Ohlone folks. The I got a message from the um, a friend who is indigenous to California, and she said that this is really important to see the the practices of basket weaving and collecting abalone shell um, and and being alongside the river because of how essential that was. Um, uh, for and it continues to be for California indigenous communities. Next slide, please. Here's the um, completed panel with uh, the Hawaiian Prince David and George Ao. 
a little bit of a glimpse of um, Santa Cruz in the, the turn of the 19th century. Next slide, please. Here's our Diosa Centeo, our corn goddess, modeled after the beautiful Reina Ruiz. <laughs> um, we have the four corn, the blue, the yellow, the white, the, the red, to kind of bring in the, the four directions, los cuatro rumbos, um, and bring in, you know, that sense of uh, diversity and um, honoring to, to all nations. Next. Do you want to talk about the Olmeca? No. Next slide. Oh, mm, did it skip one? Oh, no, it's up, I'll sit there. Oh, actually, maybe go back one. <coughs> um, so yeah, it was important to, just like in the original mural, to have images of young people going through higher education and seeing themselves in institutions of higher education. If that's, you know, the, the mural illuminates many paths towards knowledge and, and, and uh, seeking wisdom. And uh, recently I saw a photo of a young man who grew up in the beach flats who took a photo with his master's degree in front of this image of the mural, which I thought was pretty special, but really that sense of how many um, how many of us do right. We when we go on into higher education, we you know still honor our elders and honor our family and honor our roots and, and, and our ancestors and where we come from. Mm. Next, next slide. Oh yeah, this one. So I'm like a uh, yeah, um, it's a bit pixelated from our side, but he is, you could tell, I think uh, it's the image of an Olmeca head. And um, so the Olmeca are believed to be like one of the roots or the root uh, culture within uh, Mesoamerica. And um, that was the last image that I did and uh, in the uh, mural in 1993. And it sits in the same area where this was uh, painted. So it was uh, just fitting that this would be uh, included in this one also because uh, it, uh, it gives, uh, um, it honors that uh, original uh, uh, root cultura in, in, uh, in Mesoamerica for us. And so since it was about the, the theme was related to that. It was just fitting that we would bring it back in this one piece. Mm -hmm. And I included this image of with all the kids because we did get a message from the city saying that the Olmeca mm. head, they were concerned that the Olmeca head might be scary for some of the kids in the community. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when we would ask the kids, they just, they're like, yeah, we love it, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it spoke to the fact that, um, you know, uh, the image of the Olmeca isn't often seen in public art, especially considering like it's large Negroid features. Like you don't see that in public art very often. And I think the, the city maybe, you know, had some hesitancy around that, but it really was really important to keep it so that mm -hmm. um, our young people understand that, you know, our, our lineages like had go back so, so far and the history of the, our peoples have been on this continent, you know, far, uh, uh, out, um, mm -hmm. extend, you know, beyond the arrival of, of European settlers onto this uh, continent. Okay, we just have a couple more slides. So since the, the completion of the Beach Flats mural, uh, we've had the opportunity to work on one more uh, mural in the Beach Flats community. So this is at the park. It was commissioned by the Coastal Watershed Council. Um, and they wanted to bring awareness to the waterways and the health of the um, storm drains. So we had the opportunity to paint um, and kind of continue. I mean, it's used with the same paint that was used on the Beach Flats mural. Um, and also, you know, bringing in again, the Mexica, um, Mexican indigenous iconography of, of Tlaloc, the energia of the, the waters, the ecological systems, the health of the um, plants and animals along the river. So, um, so yeah, that's there today. And actually we just got invited to do another one uh, 
near Poets Park in the Beach Flats, another storm drain mural. So that's coming up later this year. And one next slide. Almost done. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, we were asked to show some other uh, murals that we've had the opportunity to uh, collaborate on together. So this mural is currently up at the Museum of Art and History here in Santa Cruz um, behind uh, what's in the Secret Garden near Abbott Square. It's part of an exhibit called Community is Collective Care and the title of the mural is called Sana Sana, We Heal Together. Um, and this mural was really all about uplifting uh, community members in in Santa Cruz County who are who are doing healing work are engaging in healing in some way for themselves for others for the collective so um, you know when we talk about murals as a as sites of resistance and ways to disrupt narrative um, you know this mural also is important because um, where it is situated tends to be a space more easily accessed by white wealthier folks so to have a mural where it's all people of color so you know there's a formerly incarcerated brother Sam a uh, trans two-spirit and uh, two-spirit indigenous Uli um, indigenous uh, mixteca farm worker Rosalina uh, trans Latina visual artist and professor Misha Luis, who um, you know does work with youth who are incarcerated. Luna, who is a hoodoo healer. You know, so for for folks to have their um, space, you know, they're forced to contend with these very real stories. And what's cool about this mural, if anyone's in Santa Cruz and can visit, if you hold your phone up to a QR code, it will take you to a um, sound cloud where you can actually hear the voices of the people portrayed in the mural telling their stories about healing and what healing means to them. So it's up until next August. So hopefully you can, can check that out. And last slide. So this one we uh, worked on for um, Turbo College um, in Hayward. And here you can see also again, I was bringing uh, uh, back uh, a little bit of our indígena cultura, the top left, the tamaya. And it has representation of uh, students uh, in higher ed, but also, uh, and also professionals, top center, uh, people who uh, in some one way or another have uh, contributed to, to uh, all of society really, not just uh, Latinos. Uh, on the bottom, you see Cesar and Dolores Huerta. And in somewhere in the middle, you see uh, young immigrants um, sort of crossing a bridge, almost as a symbol of uh, transitioning or, or moving towards a, a future, different future. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about it? Um, yeah, and again, so El Centro at Chivo College is the resource center where first-generation college students um, whose families come from Mexico, Central America, like that's where they go to receive their educational resources and build community. So this is a 20 foot by 10 foot mural that exists in that space and really to uplift and remind them that they do belong in spaces of higher education. They do, you know, can see themselves succeeding and getting that, that, that certification. And um, we also included on the bottom right, you know, different, um, the, the, the range of phenotypes and, and identities within the Latino, Latine, Chicanex, Chicane identity, it looks so diverse. And so it's important to like also have a nuanced understanding of who, who is Chicanex or Chicane. Uh, and we included in the top uh, Rigoberta Menchu. Um, uh, we included Jose Ramirez, one of the first immigrant um, born astronauts, uh, that's Gloria Ansaldúa and Justice Sonia Sotomayor. So just to highlight um, some accomplished individuals. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Victor and Irene. Um, this has been fabulous just to reinforce what, we, um, what we've been talking about with the Eduardo Carrillo Comunidad de Califas um, at the Cezanon Gallery, as well as um, at the Monterey Museum of Art. Um, we, um, for the art, art of the state, um, 
symposium. And that's where I heard you speak just, you know, in January. And I realized we need to bring you to our Cezanne Speak Up series so you could tell this fabulous story. And also we wanted to let you know that, you know, we'll keep telling this story. And I, I want our UCSD students to know it, people who, you know, live in Santa Cruz, because stories like this can easily uh, be forgotten uh, about the whole beach flats. And, and so I really wanted to thank you for, you know, for taking the time. Also, and many of us lived here during the, uh, the whitewashing of the mural, and, you know, it did take a while. So it, it was um, interesting to see what parts of the story emerged. So I'm really Really, really thankful that you put this together, and I can see students looking, um, making films about it, or you know, continuing working. And the other thing is the mentorship that you talked about, uh, Victor, with Eduardo Carrillo. You know um, how important that is, and also um, Irene, you talked about you know your colleagues, or, uh, Reina Ruiz, and then Ernestina uh, Saldana. You know, to advocating just for cultural iconography and to you know maintain murals as a site of resistance. And um, so I think that, um, anyway, the Cezanne Gallery is gonna keep up your, your um, mission and really try to get more students involved uh, with the Beach Plus projects and things like that. Um, I also wanted to just say, and we have lots of questions, we have a few prepared and a few in the chat, um, that the Eduardo Carrillo Comunidad de Cal Califas is part of this, um, the Califas Legacy Project. And this is uh, organized by the uh, Eduardo Carrillo Museo uh, the Museo Eduardo Carrillo, the Monterey Museum of Art, the Santa Cruz Art League, the M Moving Parts Press with Fe uh, Felicia Rice, uh, also the Special Collections and Archives at UC Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, the Watsonville Public Libraries. So we really wanted to, you know, thank you for bringing, bringing this out. But I'd like to, um, I see a really great question from Betsy Anderson as part of the Museo Project. Um, can we can we go in from there? Because I'd like to yeah. say, um, Betsy asks, um, murals are often called uh, the most vulnerable art forms. And how do you feel about knowing the murals will be painted over? I mean, the beach flats might be a little different because it's a community center, but how do you feel about um, murals being painted over? And are you involved in alternative ways of uh, digitizing them or keeping them alive? <laughs> Great question. Um, so it's so interesting that, you know, uh, Victor's was a student of Ed who had a mural uh, erased in Santa Cruz and Ed was a, a student of Siqueiros who also had murals uh, erased. And I think part of my understanding of being in this legacy of mural making as a Chicana muralist is that that's the reality that there is a temporal nature to the murals we create. Um, and even now, you know, uh, the mural needs attention because there's like bushes growing and it's weathering. So, you know, I think that's something to consider. But what 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 I feel good about is knowing that um, it's going to be it's at least because of the story and, and as much community organizing as there's been around the, the Beach Flats mural, the it's not going to need to be repainted because someone damaged it or the city did anything to it is that's my hope because we the work we've put in it's going to be because you know we live near the ocean and the weather is you know deteriorating it and that's my hope honestly but it's true um you know murals are always a contentious site and i think um part of what we're doing to to keep it alive is you know this event and this this slideshow is really important. We also have a website, beachflatsmural.com, where we have a lot of videos and, and archive uh, footage of the of the wall. But I think we also are aware of the fact that at some point we probably will need to repaint it. Um, uh, but now we know that we have the support of the community, and the community is going to show out when and if it's when it's time to do that. Yeah, uh, I I just put it like this. So I think, uh, yeah, I, uh, I I think differently now, like before I, I thought like it's gonna, whatever I do should be there forever. And, you know, then later it's like, well, well, who am I to say what people should like or not or appreciate? Um, but I do believe that, um, that now I think like they have, they will run their course, but uh, it, it all depends on the community that surrounds it, right? So it gets to a point where it is valued, sustained value, then that's why it was so important to talk to Reina and other people when that uh, whitewashing occurred. Because I remember saying like, what is it What is it that you want? 
what the community would want to do now that that happened, right? So at the time I was uh, away and I had this history with the mural in the community and everybody knew, but it was like, um, I need to get guidance from, from you guys to let me know what, what should happen because you are there, right? So then it becomes uh, part of that community's uh, uh, history. Um, but the other thing that I wanna mention is that uh, I always thought, I think that the process itself is the most valuable thing. So how does a piece, so, so yeah, so digitizing uh, um, the piece itself becomes that way of, of maintaining uh, the documentation of that piece at that given moment. But the longer lasting um, way that, that, that the mural will live on is by the stories you tell, uh, whether it be while you're creating it. That's why it's so important to have youth, especially children. You didn't show a lot of the images of children working on it. And, and uh, at the time when we did that 90s one, the same thing happened. And I remember very, very conscious about that, telling it, the older uh, youth, you know, let them do it. You know, don't, don't worry about what, if the paint spills because they will, they will remember and, and they'll live on in them. So that's really, I, I wanna, that's the essence really of how the murals survive because then future artists get inspired by the stories told and they get to create their own, um, their works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that is really fabulous. And you, I love the community um, shots of um, getting input from, from the community. Those are some really valuable slides, part of the process of making it as well as painting. And then uh, Roberto said, um, should we create a, a mural watch group? Um, you know, uh, but I think all artists need advocates and, um, and, and gardens. I mean, I love this connection between that the garden uh, your connection with the garden sparked uh, this awareness of the mural and this taking care of the land together. Um, so anyway, it just made me think of uh, a lot of connections we can make and help as a university and the arts division can um, uh, put some initiatives forward too. Because there's a lot of students that would like to get involved um, about, you know, just being aware. There's a lot of um, things to to be aware of. Um, how about anyone, any other um, or comments or another question? Um, I was I, gonna, I'll share ahead. something um, yeah. that, you know, Betsy brought up that murals are really vulnerable, but I think that they're also very powerful for the space that they take up. And so maybe this is um, a question also that's open for anyone from the Beach Flats community or folks who worked on the mural itself, um, because Victor touched on the mentorship and this intergenerational um, legacy of people working together. So my question is about the future. And so um, I, I don't know if Irene mentioned how the, the Beach Flats Park mural is 190 feet long, but I'm imagining that if it were another 190 feet longer, you know, what are the next visual stories that are to be told? So this is an, an open question for, for anyone to share um, a response to. Maybe I should call on Nicole since she'll be, she'll be the next lead artist for the next mural. <laughs> or Reina, I mean, really, again, it really depends on what do the folks who live there, who, who go to that park every day, who, um, whose lives and stories are there in that space, like what do they wanna see? What do they see for themselves? Um, and, and I really feel like that's our role as artists is to, help um, paint that picture, help um, share that story. But yeah, Reina, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, it really depends, right? I think when I approached, I, I think I was, I, I, when I approached Victor about like next steps for the mirror, what we were thinking and helping, I think, um, you know, he came back to, well, what does the community want? And I know I had been the director of Beach Flats Community Center for about 14 years. And it was in my absence that we had started the conversation about the Beach Flats mural. I think the year before I left, I, I left this, the, my position as the community liaison. And part of the conversation that I had with the city was, well, we have like three options, right? Do we keep what we have? Do we um, make a new one that's a hybrid of the old and the new, or do we create a whole new one? that's not something that we can answer on our own, that we need its end, that's one part. And then the second part was we need to proceed very carefully um, and with a lot of 
responsibility because this mural has been up for years and it's a beloved mural. And so it really requires a community process. So that, those were a couple of things that I think are important, right? Um, that like, if we're looking at future, we need to go back to well, those three questions, right? Like moving forward, what do, how, do, how do we want to move forward? One, two, three. And then how do we engage community or how does community get involved in deciding that? Um, and I, I think that's important and we can't take shortcuts. Um, I think we've used the matching, matching grant to kind of move a little bit faster, but sometimes moving faster doesn't take into account that you have to do translation in a community that's mostly Latino. Um, or, you know, you have to take consideration who's who's here now, who, and, and how do we want to move forward? Yeah, that, that's really, that's so true. Um, also, one of our um, film and uh, theater professors mentioned that, you know, it, it's almost like a, a, a theater performance, you know, the, the act, the process of painting the mural and all the things that go on. Um, so I think it's, it, it is a, you know, it's a beautiful moment and um, it can be captured and experienced in many ways. So, um, yeah, and it's mural is really truly you know an art form that that that, that is a temporal and it, and it involves a lot of people, uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting and it's nice to kind of envelop new generations. You know, you've done so with this you know project right here, and that's it's really beautiful. Um, we there's a question from Roberto. Maybe we could um, does the city of Santa Cruz have an arts commission? Yes, indeed. And Luis can talk to that and the mural committee. So maybe do you want to talk because there's a robust committee. Um. Yeah, there is a, a city of Santa Cruz Arts Commission. We also have the, the current city arts manager here in our meeting tonight, Catherine Mintz. Um, so um, and they advise and they review proposals for murals and other public art. And there's definitely movements towards um, having more criteria about equity and inclusion and really critical um, critical thought and about how the calls are getting out there. I mean, that's that's a really big one is, is how even the distribution of the calls, how can that be more equitable to reach people so it's not the same applicants every time. So there's definitely a lot of discussion about it. Um, but of course, there's always more work to be done. So thank you. I think, um, yeah, in, in that respect, I think that had it not been, that's why I brought like the, the Freedom Mural, had it not been for knowing those community members in the flats, visiting the apartment at that time and looking at the mural, then I, I myself as a student, especially being a second year student, like I don't think I would have gone through that process, right? Uh, how far would I have gone through the process of getting a, a city park commission, right? So it is about like, well, who do you know and how do we build those relationships? Um, and the other part about like, you know, because at the time uh, Ed, um, Ed told me, um, Victor, I saw the newspaper in the 90s, 93. And he said, uh, did you, somebody showed me an article by the mural. And he did kind of, what he didn't brought up, it, it brought up to mind what he told me. He said like, they were saying that the mural was, uh, it wasn't well liked by everybody. Let's put it that way, right? Um, and then he said, you know, if you keep doing this, this is gonna keep happening. Kind of joking around, right? Because he always wanted me to, you know, be engaged, but it's like, you know, you keep doing this type of work, you know, people are always gonna bump heads with you. Um, but the reason why I think at that time uh, it was important and why it became even more important now is because in the span of those 20 some years, I think that there had not been this, uh, maybe there was, but not this, uh, uh, this conscious effort to continue that process, to diversify the arts in so many ways, whether it be cultural or not, especially, particularly cultural, right? So that when the mural came back to representing uh, uh, a, community, a community of color, um, history in a com largely community of color, it became problematic again. But had those works had been just popping up everywhere through our city, that, that wouldn't have been the problem, right? Because it was already naturally 
uh, occurring everywhere. You could go to the West Side. You could see a Latino mural or or a Asian American or what have you. Or you could go to the uh, you could go to um, so Kel, you understand what I'm saying? So so the mural became problematic again when the process was started because that that growth had not occurred in those 20 years, in my opinion. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you're still you're still in it and you're still doing it. So um, and that was good uh, advice from Ed to, yeah. you know, uh, we all have to continue. Um, there's another uh, question here. How is the city of Santa Cruz prioritizing BIPOC murals currently? And I think you mentioned a little bit about um, diversity and inclusion, Louise, and also a, another question about protection. D does the city protect the murals? Um, yeah, there's um, so the the Santa Cruz City Arts Commission, the you know it's for it's for the public city owned properties, and there is a process to um, maintain the the condition of the public works that are in the city's collection. So there is an effort um, to review the condition of the of say the murals or the sculptures that are in, and ongoing efforts. Um, uh, Kathy, is there anything that you you want to share about the direction of the of the arts commission well when louise was the chair i could say that the arts commission was a leader in the city in terms of making a commitment to equity inclusivity and environmental justice which actually was picked up and furthered in the city with a uh, health and all policies which has uh, very similar standards so Really, um, we're reviewing it, particularly in the arts, with every contract or every project we let out about the inclusivity and what efforts have been made to encourage it and to promote it. And um, even with the uh, upcoming storm drain mural uh, project uh, that Irene will be working on, there's still the close scrutiny of Irene will be working on it and who else? And how will she bring people in to really nurture and promote the art in the, in the BIPOC community? So um, it's it's difficult. The protection is difficult because of uh, the vandalism in our community. And there are some murals right now that I've had reports on that need that need some uh, maintenance. But um, I'd encourage you to reach out and let me know and be and be the eyes and ears. But because I. Uh, We've learned from mistakes. I wasn't here at that time, but um, I think the community is a little bit smarter now and appreciates hearing the different voices. I know I do. Yeah, well, thank you all um, for contributing. And we'll, we'll follow up with some of those questions because um, I agree. I think there should be funding for um, if artists need to come back in to, to repair. You know, that's a, a, an issue to be discussed. But I think that um, it, it's come up when we when we get sculptures on campus, we write a little clause that um, we get a donor to fund if there's some repairs needed because everything takes every piece of art takes care and, and you know that's sort of the curator's job and things like that. So um, and it takes funding. So there might you know might be something we could we could look into you know to build it into um, a project. Um, but anyway, yes, I, I agree. This has been really fabulous. I just appreciate everyone's time and please let's stay connected. Um, we've got a lot of uh, a lot more to discuss about uh, about this and, and also the Eduardo Carrillo uh, Comunidad de Califas, uh, lots of things. Next week, do you have the slide of the next project? Yeah. I mean, our next um, event, we can show you this. Um, this will be next week, uh, our next Cezanne Speak Speakup, uh, Chicanx Visual Aesthetics, and we have Amy Diaz uh, Infante and uh, Angelica uh, Muro, and they both teach at CSUMB, um, really fabulous speakers. And they're, you know, um, they also spoke at this um, Art of the State con um, conference symposium down in Monterey, and they said, "Hey, where's the uh, the feminist voice? What you know? What what's going on in uh, in our um, Chicanx and um, you know artwork? Let let's 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 speak up." So here we are um, having a session on speak up about you know a lot of um, issues we all we all want to address. So it's really this one uh, is going to be equally. Um, uh, you know, enlightening. So thank you all and just stay tuned and, you know, send us the line, email, sesnon at ucsc.edu. <laughs>